I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. Can coenzyme Q10 reduce the appearance of wrinkles? Well, a university in Germany tested it, published an article in the Journal of Aging Research. I'll share the outcome of that and about 12 other articles today, always from peer-reviewed literature, always from respected institutions, and always things that empower us to live a longer and healthier life. I'm happy to be one of the voices sharing that today. There was a time when, well, we really only had a couple voices. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, it was, it was Bernard McFadden. In fact, I had the privilege of meeting his wife, Johnny Lee McFadden. She came into the studio, WMCA, back, I think it was around 1975. She had these really blue eyes. I mean, it, it almost, if you saw a photograph, it would look like it was Photoshop. Those were her eyes. She was extremely healthy. I think at the time she was around 85. And she had a set, an original first edition set of her husband's books. I didn't even know who her husband was. He was the second major publisher behind William Randolph Hearst. He published True Detective and all these other publications. And she said... I've been listening to you, and my friends and I th are saying, you're the new Bernard McFadden. <laughs> I said, well, thank you. I don't know who he is. So she would come in and bring books and magazines, and she brought a whole coterie of these women that she knew who were friends, and they were all into natural hygiene and health. They were just vibrant and upbeat and positive. I'm guessing the average age was 80. I'm like in my young 20s. And I began to read his books. He was way ahead of the curve. Now, he had been motivated by Dr. Kellogg, one of the two Kellogg brothers that founded the Battle Creek, Michigan, Kellogg Cereal Company. And he was very much, he was the, he was the originator. Then from Kellogg, it went Bernard McFadden, but then it went in the 1920s, around 19, well, 1927 to 1930. There was another person. His name was Gaylord Hauser. He was a trip. If you ever watched him, he was very dynamic. He was a true dynamic energy. And when he walked into a room, he held the presence of that room. And <clears throat> by the way, it's G-A-Y as in gay, Lord Hauser. <clears throat> and he wrote a lot of good books. Uh, Hauser is H-A-U-S-E-R. G-A-Y-E-L-O-R-D, Gaylord. What was his book? He gave me a copy, signed it. Look Younger, Live Longer. He also did a guide to an intellectual uh, reducing. He was a believer in strict caloric reduction, but he was the main voice in the celebrity health movement from about 1930 to around 1960. So for 30 years, he was the person. And... Oh, let's let me think. Who? Because I spoke. I'm I'm met and actually counseled some of the people. There was Paulette Goddard, and Greta Garbo, and Marlena Dietrich, and Gloria Swanson, and a whole. There must have been two or three hundred. Now his diet was not bad. It was not excellent. What he called Gaylord's Gruel, his famous cereal in the morning. They had everyone eat. <clears throat> And he restricted caloric intake, <clears throat> and he got him exercising, all of which was good. Not perfect, but good. And then around 1960, we saw the rise of Carlton Fredericks and Adele Davis. Adele was warm, charming, had this kind of grandmother quality to her. She was a nurse. I, I think it was last year I found a copy of a book she gave me. And I interviewed her. And I'm going through the book as a recipe book. And I'm thinking, my God, I would not recommend a single recipe because everything in here would clog your arteries. But people loved her. She sold millions of books. Gaylord, Hals uh, Gaylord Hauser had no background, no formal training whatsoever in health or nutrition. He was condemned to criticize at the time by the very establishment that, that was wrong. And he was right. Um, by the way, last evening I was, I took a break from writing a commentary I'm going to give you today on the show. It, it's a heady commentary. Some are, are 
you know, easier uh, to understand, and some you have to dig a little deeper to understand the real villainy in Wikipedia and some of the skeptics' thinking. And this is one of those discussions I'm going to have today. Anyway, I took a break, and I the only television I, I watch is Turner Television, because I like some of the old classics. Great writing, great lighting, directing, producing, and acting. But there were two back-to-back. -back. I don't know if any of them saw them. Last night was, one was a trite little comedy with Cary Grant and when William Randolph uh, Scott. And he was a very popular, <clears throat> very handsome guy. Great physique. And it, <laughs> the scene is where Cary Grant is about to order lunch and they're at the swimming pool. And there Scott gets up on the diving board. And he, by any measure today, he would be considered really uh, healthy and, and cut. So they go to have lunch and uh, Cary Grant says, well, I'll have the meat. And he said, well, I'll have, I'm a vegetarian. I don't, <laughs> I don't eat meat. So I'll have a fresh made carrot juice and a salad with some carrots. And I'm thinking, well, that's the first time I ever heard someone advocating vegetarianism in a film. Now, maybe there were others. I, I didn't see all films, needless to say. <clears throat> but I just thought that was kind of interesting because at that time, in the 30s, Gaylord Hauser was the voice for a healthy diet in Hollywood. I was just curious, wonder if the scriptwriter used any of the popularity because Hauser was everywhere in all the magazines, newspapers, everywhere. He loved the media. Anyhow, skip ahead. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington with Jimmy Stewart. It was a, and Claude Rains. And if you haven't seen it, wow. If there's one film that stands out, it's that. Now, there are more profound films that stand out. Uh, with Charles Lawton and s some of the later ones, and Horson Wells. But this was absolutely unique in this sense. <clears throat> and a very idealistic person goes to Washington and is initially groomed by those in power, but then he's supposed to line up behind a corrupt dam, and the dam is owned by the richest man in the state who controls the politic of the state, controls the media, controls everything. And so they go to censor the young idealist. They set him up. They lie about him. The media doesn't question the lies. And he's to be thrown out of the Senate. But at the last moment, this woman motivates him to stand up. How would, the, how would all those young people, those teenagers, you were trying to find a place for a couple weeks a year to go and be in nature um, and... How would they feel if you had to go home and say, I didn't put up a fight, I just accepted defeat? Very motivational. I mean, very inspiring. That's when in the movie, its script, its writing, begins to touch your heart. So I'm sitting here, I'm feeling this energy. I'm thinking, my God, they're talking about today. That 60-year-old film is absolutely today. How the whole machine is corrupt, the oligarchy, the left and the right, the Democrat and Republican, from Clintons, the most corrupt couple to ever hold power in America, through the media, to Rachel Maddow and, and Sean Hannity, all of them, all swimming in one gigantic shark pool looking for a nosebleed. And the people who challenge it, the people who are like Jimmy Stewart, who say, we're going to talk about what's wrong. Whether you, whether you have power or not, wrong is still wrong. Yeah. But they have the power to make you wrong because they can control public perception of you. They can lie about you. They, they manipulate everything. They manipulate Wikipedia. They lie on Wikipedia all the time about who people are in their background. Great people. People far above in spiritual and ethical values than the editors who are editing their blogs not allowing any changes. In any case, he gets up and he uses common sense and reason and people respond. Even when they're being propagandized by the news media, this person's wrong, throw him out of Washington, he's a disgrace. So he had no advocate on his side except 
the lead character, this corrupt old senator, finally reminds himself of ethics and then confesses. And then that's the story. You really should watch this film. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. It sometimes it's confused with Mr. Deeds, with Gary Cooper, also with Barbara Stanwyck in a moral story about power corrupting. But this is a this is absolutely you think this was written for today, where everything is lopsided, everything is upside down, everything is the opposite, <clears throat> and people are awakening. People by the millions are standing up and they're saying, No more. You've lied to us, you betrayed us. Who do you think voted for Trump? Do you want to believe that it was a bunch of, quote, um, rednecks, you know, racists, white supremacists? That's it, 63 million of them? It's not. Trump would not have been elected on any circumstance had the Democrats followed up on their promises they've been making for 50 years. And everything they said they would do for people, they did just the opposite knowing the average person doesn't follow carefully through on a bill, a law, and how it impacts them. Well, now people are awake. So if you can, watch that. Anyhow, <clears throat> that was just a little aside, because the two things came together last night, and I, I wrote a little bit about it. So here's the question on health. Can coenzyme Q10 reduce the appearance of wrinkles? Well, a recent article, which appeared in the Journal of Aging, showed that coenzyme Q10 can help address aging-related skin issues, such as your dryness, wrinkles, and loss of skin elasticity. And it was published in a highly respected Applied Science, University of um, Applied Sciences in Germany. So, good. And they call it the mitochondria. And you know the mitochondria. That's the power plants of your cells. That's what gives you energy. They create a product called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. As you age, beyond the age of 27, you're now an advanced age, biologically, you reduce mitochondria. Well, what happens? You can't exercise as long or as hard. You can't think as long without you know, getting brain fatigue. You can't remember as well. You start to lose your cognition, but you have billions, hundreds of billions of cells, so it takes time until the day comes in your 50s when you really start to forget things. What, 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 what the heck was the name of that movie I saw? What was, I just read a page in a book. I can't remember what I read. And then you start to realize, where'd I put my keys? And then you're outside. Did I turn off the fire when I was making tea? These things start to go through us. You're not at the beginning of an aging process then. You're way advanced. So, these mitochondria generate energy for the cells by converting food molecules into adenosine triphosphate, a molecule that stores and transfers energy. But over time, the mitochondria become damaged due to oxidative stress and toxins and infections. This hampers their ability to produce ATP and can leave cells with an energy deficit. In the skin, a lack of ATP means that cells are unable to maintain and repair themselves causing the skin to appear wrinkled and saggy. So there's where coenzyme Q10 comes in, and it works. Now, I suggest that if you use it with quercetin and vitamin C together, you have tighter skin, better skin, and overall improved quality of skin. From John Hopkins School of Public Health comes a new study on the ethno- botanical medicine is effective against the bacterium causing Lyme's disease. Now, this is new, and this is really important considering how many people I counsel with Lyme's disease. And Lyme's disease is, is also called Borreliosis, B-O-R-R-E-L-I-O-S-I-S. -E it's the most common vector-borne disease in Northern Hemisphere. It's caused by a spirochete, uh, the corkscrew-shaped spirochete, the bacterium Borrelia uh, borgifolia, and it's a close relative, means mainly spread through the bite of infected ticks. Currently, there are 300,000 new cases every year, compared to 65,000 in Europe. And by the way, 
if you should have a farm or if you have enough property, get yourself guinea hens. They're terrific on two counts. One, they're voracious eaters of ticks, spiders, fleas, whatever's in that ground they're going to eat and eat a ton of it. And they're also, they go together, they're very funny to watch. Suddenly they'll all go running together and for no particular reason. But if there's a predator around, they squawk. They put up a, you know, put up a noise. So they're good watch animals. And I have them. Uh, always have chickens free roaming and they come back in the evening when it gets sunset and then you lock them in for safety. Same thing with the guinea hens. And once you keep a guinea hen, a peacock, uh, in fact, I'm going to be giving away some peacocks to people who want to give them a home for life. Uh, normally, a peacock will live around five years, sometimes seven years. Mine, I've got one still alive 13 years later. And uh, they're very beautiful animals. They're tame. They're easy. They go through patterns where they like to go each day. Um, in any case, um, you keep them locked up in a confined place for three weeks, and you feed them water every day, clean their area. Then you let them out. And that's how you keep them from going out. Also, if you make sure that each day uh, you have food at the right time, like, you know, some grains you give them. And I give them raw organic peanuts every morning, every afternoon. And they won't fly away. They won't go away. Anyhow, just something for you to know to get rid of ticks. That's the key. Keep in mind, in all my years of living on a farm or a ranch and being an organic farmer, I've never had poison ivy, poison oak, peas, and sumac. Not, I'm not immune to it. It's just I pay attention. And I always put coconut oil on my skin when I'm working outside in the garden. And that protects you. It also protects you from mosquitoes. No mosquito bites and no ticks. Always wear white socks. Just put a little Vaseline around and tea trail around the bottom of your shoe and it prevents the ticks from getting on. And if one should get on, then you see it. And you put your sock on the outside of your pants when you're hiking. I love to hike, love to go in the woods. <clears throat> After all, I spent 10 years in the scouts and got up to a scoutmaster and lots of time with nature. Just be smart, just be attentive and it works. So now we know that, that ethno-botanical medicine is effective against this. Before it was just antibiotics, 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 but a good article published in the Peer Review Journal Frontiers in Medicine at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and that was also California Center for Functional Medicine, and they found 14 plant extracts to kill the Borrella compared to the current use Lyme antibiotics, doxycycline, and uh, the researchers tested these extract effectiveness in vitro, meaning outside of a living organism, and they found that it really worked. They, they show black walnut, cat's claw, sweet wormwood, Mediterranean rock rose, Chinese skull cap had strong activity against the uh, Lyme spirochete. And by the way, outperform the antibiotics with no negative side effects. So, something new, something natural, something important, and something that works. Oh, and by the way, I was asked the other day, I was down at the farmer's market, and I go down there to get the food for what I don't grow myself for, for uh, the animals. I like to get them fresh, organic, Food, and I like to support farmers' markets. And a uh, person came up and said, I listen to your show when I can, and I'm not sure what to do if I buy some blueberries, because I can't get organic ones, and these are not organic, but they're local grown. How can I clean them? And I said simply this, and I'll tell you the same thing. Take some baking soda, simple baking soda. Add two teaspoons of baking soda to a bowl of water. Then you put your produce in the water and let it sit there for 
10 minutes. Then agitate it, rinse it, throw out the water, agitate, rinse, throw out the water, and you're good to go. You've removed all of the debris, bacteria, molds, yeast, fungi, and pesticides. And if you're concerned about hypertension because you're pregnant, which is really common, according to a new Malpighia University in Italy, vitamin D, calcium, folic acid, and resveratrol can prevent the development of hypertension during pregnancy. So, all good. We are 20 minutes into our program. I'll save the rest for another day because we're going to take a break. And when we come back, a new, original, in-depth essay entitled, A Marriage Made in Hell, Militant Atheism, Scientism, Wikipedia, and Eugenics. I'll be tying that all together. Please stay with us. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome all of you. I'm Gary Nall. A little bit hoarse because I was counseling for six hours last evening to about midnight, then I was on the phone dictating. And uh, then I have the person I dictate to for about an hour, write it up and then send it back, and then I edit it and then put it in its final form. And this article is by Richard Gale and myself. The many apparent discoveries and successes in science and medicine have awarded these advances with an authority we are far too often accepting without question. Skepticism is a necessary and healthy faculty. We should all be skeptical to examine for the truth, not allow our conditioned self, whether familiar conditioning, political conditioning, religious conditioning, uh, civic conditioning, to be the final arbiter of what is true, but rather use our own individual capacity, common sense, reason, and facts. It's like saying, this person's been accused of something, so therefore they must be guilty. No, that may have the power of social mob rule authority, but it has not been proven until it is and then use the facts at hand rather than our opinion, because opinions, as we know, can vary and be extremely misleading. So I believe that we should hold a healthy skepticism. Would you believe everything that is said by Rachel Maddow or Sean Hannity on the other side of that political equation? You shouldn't. What if neither have the truth? What if a place that they do not deem acceptable has the truth? If I have an opportunity to listen to someone speak on a topic, two oncologists, one oncologist is highly re respected and deemed the ultimate authority in chemotherapy, works for a major institution. Good. That person makes their presentation. I don't emotionally involve my energy in it. I simply look at it as information. But on the other side, I'm now given another discussion on oncology and cancer and what this person says as a clinical board certified oncologist is exactly the opposite of what the other. The one is saying that there are hundreds of cancers, they each have different causes, they must each be treated differently, and you're going to use surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation in some combination and then tamoxifen afterwards and possibly preventative radiation and preventative chemotherapy. and all of the science is on our side. On the other side, the person says, well, that's what I used to do and didn't find out that it worked. So I began to broaden my perspective and today I have a different way of approaching cancer. I'm looking at the immune system, not the tumor. I'm not just looking to treat symptoms, infected lymph glands, 
or a metastasis, but rather I'm also trying to see how I can engage the body's natural immune response in this process. Now I have a choice. I can believe neither, I can believe some of each, or I can look at for the truth and try to verify which of these two people who are both firmly of the conviction that they are right actually holds the truth. That's where skepticism is an asset, where it is positive. It is a part, as I said, of a healthy faculty. However, when skepticism itself becomes a doctrine unto itself, then a large body of scientific evidence that convincingly takes authority to task is simply denied or aggressively denounced. So in our society today, the oncologist who said there's only one way and everywhere else is quackery, even if you're another oncologist, even if every one of your cancer patients has their cancer reversed, you're wrong. And even if every one of my patients dies, I'm still right because I'm the authority. You don't challenge authority. We never challenge authority until we do. Surrendering critical thinking and healthy skepticism to authority figures and institutions more often than not sidelines both the scientific and social need for and institutions more often than not do not allow open and honest debate that can bring forth evidence that challenges the rule and control of a dominant authoritative view. Of course, many of the most radical scientific voices of the past who challenged authoritative paradigms were marked heretics, Galileo and Newton. And inevitably, with the passage of time, the mavericks were proven correct. The power at the moment was wrong. Think for a moment. Who was right about Vietnam? All of us who were against the war for obvious reasons or those who were pro-war? Did they ever apologize? Did anyone ever lose their position of power or authority? No. Think about the Iraq War. Who was right with weapons of mass destruction and regime change? No one had to pay a penalty for being wrong, and those in power, no matter how often they make the wrong choice, still maintain their power. And those who are right and challenge power are always excluded from having been given any respect. Today, the para pariahs and of the dominant scientific order include Deepak Chopra and Rupert Sheldrake and Nobel laureates such as Professor Brian Josephson and Professor Luc Montagnier and numerous medical professionals who have had the courage to look outside the glass walls of the dominant medical paradigm. But worse, when skepticism surrenders its own reasoning in order to proselytize an ideology or dogma then it risks being a very real danger to society. Hence today, what we have at every level of our society, we need gas holder faking, we need coal burning fireplaces, we need vaccines, we needed mandate vaccines, not just for ch children and, and babies one hour old, but for adults and senior citizens. Well, what we have then is we have a society that has collectively become a fundamentalist cult. This includes the entirety of our medical industrial, scientific industrial, educational industrial complexes. Modern skepticism as a movement within the sciences has become a pseudoscience, better known as scientism. The extreme radicalized new atheism, represented by Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and Jerry Coin, Stephen Novella, etc., is a natural outcome of scientism's false certainty in its own absolute and rigid beliefs that have been transformed into rational objectivity. The Miriam Webster Dictionary defines scientism as, quote, an exaggerated trust in the efficacy of the methods of natural science applied to all areas of investigation, end quote. So I want to understand this very carefully. It is not who is doing a better job in any field, a more honest job, a more balanced and objective job. 
It is who is assumed has the authority in a given field, even if every result they get is wrong or deadly. Think of that, please, for a moment. This earmarks a fundamental characteristic in modern skepticism, an exaggerated trust in its own methodology and belief system leading to a fallacious and pretentious faith that it can explain everything based upon reason and ob observation. But that's not true. I can give you many examples. I'll just give you one. And there are photographs of different scientists and physicians and myself and Dr. Dolores Krieger and Rabbi Abraham Wiseman and many others in a, in a very important seminal study. I did this at the Institute of Applied Biology where I was a research fellow and the director of anti-aging medicine. And this was given a quiet approval to do as long as we did not discuss it because they didn't think that the other faculty members and the other orthodox scientists would appreciate it. But in the South, there are what we call the praying, praying doctors. These are doctors, not all, but these are doctors of faith who will come and sit beside a patient in a hospital or a home, hold their hand and pray with them. And the question was, did it make a difference? Was it purely a placebo effect? So I wanted to see if there was a scientific way of evaluating this by uh, what is known as Occam's Razor, a 14th century theologian, philosopher, and ethicist, who used the concept of the razor of cutting through all of the nonsensical uh, thoughts and beliefs and going right to the issue. And the only way I could do that is get non-humans who would not be influenced by a placebo, hence mice, and people who claim they could help heal, always from different backgrounds, and then see could they do it. And of 50 people who were in this study that took almost a year to prepare, six of the individuals were able to duplicate the healing that no one else had. But then that doesn't prove anything. You have to reproduce it. We reproduced it six times over a year. And over that year, every single one of those six people was able to re remove the cancer completely. So we knew we had a phenomena that showed that we did not understand it. Now, each person can say they understood it from their own belief system, and they could be right. But science would not have that because it wouldn't want to just a phenomena. It would understand the mechanisms because until it understands the mechanisms, and that's its reductionistic value system, reduce it all down to a mathematical equation, they wouldn't accept it. So we cured mice six times out of six, just, just the same six people did it, Rabbi Abraham Wiseman, Dr. Thomas Kruth, um, Dr., uh, let's see, there was Dr. Mo Morton Jacobs, uh, Dr. Audrey Carger, and uh, the head of nursing at New York University Medical School. And from that effort that she made, she was so impressed that she founded Therapeutic Touch. So every nursing college in the United States that teaches Therapeutic Touch that's where it originated, that study. But you see, the skeptics would not accept that, even though it, we used every possible gold standard scientific principle to validate it because they can't understand. They can't wrap their minds around because they're not people of faith. And if you're not a person of faith, then how do you believe that you, as a person of faith, can share an energy that can transcend the limitations of a reductionist way of healing? Or you can only heal with medicine. You can only heal with surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. You can't heal with a thought or a prayer. That's nonsense. You're superstitious. You're, you know, you're, you're a fool. No. People throughout all of history have used their faith to understand the power of healing. So that's one of the limitations that we're presented with. So as an example, again, the absolute belief that the only way to treat cancers is through chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. I'm repeating this just so you emphasize this. In spite of the statistics that several hundred thousand die annually from the treatment, not the cancer. So if we have nearly 600,000 dying this past year 
from cancer, at least 300,000 or more died from the treatment itself. Hence, scientism's paradox, and this is a paradox, that people who are rewarded based upon the certainty of their beliefs and methodologies, even when the results fail to be achieved by the desired goal. It is not the therapy that should be challenged then, the chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, but rather the rigid thinking of those who hold the authority over these treatments at the expense of denying all other cancer treatments. In effect, it is our trust in authority figures, those who hold power, that blinds us from critically investigating what they are advocating. And that is a true in the political landscape as anywhere else. I'll give you one more example of this. <clears throat> Do you remember I said that we could save not $300 billion, as Bernie Sanders touting, but we could save $1.7 trillion a year. We've proven it. We've shared it. We've written about it. It is out there. Leading economists around the world, like Michael Hudson, Professor Hudson, have reviewed this. Because what we did, we simply took each piece of the problem and we said, where does this money go to? Well, $1 trillion goes to the insurance industry for administration fees. But if you have universal health care under Medicare, you don't need the administration. You could remove that. Then doctors are over-treating because they're afraid of being sued. So they have to over-treat everything, over-diagnose, over-test. You could save $200 billion there. The price of drugs, some drugs we found and actually published the top 10 drugs in America, number one through 10, and they make anywhere from 3,000 to 300,000 percent markup over the 30-day generic. And we gave how much a 30-day supply at the generic level, like 10 cents, 10 pennies, and it goes for 300 or $400. Now, if we can find this out and we publish it, putting ourselves out there, putting our reputations out there, putting our scholarship out there, saying, this is what we're saying. Give industry a profit of 200%. If you go into any store in the United States, if you go into a bakery or a restaurant, if you go into a drugstore, they're working on under 50%. So let's give medicine 200%, the pharmaceutical industry. You would save over $200 billion a year by the excess profiteering. Do the same thing for hospitals and every hospital procedure. And therefore, you say, well, this bag of saline cost the hospital $2. You're selling it for $100 to the patient. Get rid of that. So if you took the excess profit out, you would save $1.7 trillion, and we went through all of it. But that is reasonable science and scholarship. What we have is an irrational belief that people who are unqualified in any of these areas get together and someone in an office who's assigned to policy on foreign policy, policy on banking policy, policy on debt uh, policy. These people come together and throw together papers so the legislators just have to recite them, mimic what they're told. This isn't any way to have honest and authentic change, but that's what we have everywhere. The same... The same self-confidence extends to modern skepticism, scientism, to discredit everything associated with religion and spirituality. The paranormal, nonsense they say, and non-conventional and traditional medical systems don't try them. In short, similar to religious fundamentalism, when skepticism takes its beliefs literally, it becomes its own ideology. And at this ideology, not unlike today's most militant religious movements, poses an enormous threat to a democratic society and the freedoms of a true democracy. If we say we're a democracy, well, we're actually a republic, but I think everyone understands we should have freedoms. But we have no freedom of choice when it comes to medicine, nor do our children. In the developed world, we are fortunate to have freedom of speech, freedom to follow a religion or not. We have the choice to marry or not. We can marry who we want without an arranged marriage. We have the freedom to decide what we can eat, how much and when. We can decide the freedom 
to choose to abuse or to benefit our bodies? There are still choices to decide on the type of medical treatment we prefer, but those are being eliminated. Unfortunately, many of our freedoms are now being oppressively challenged. For example, the unholy alliance between the pharmaceutical industry and federal and state governments is determined to mandate and enforce vaccination. The unspoken hidden argument in this effort is that we have no choice nor should we have choices because we are merely the unwashed illiterate. Therefore, those on high, there goes back to what I said earlier, they're the authorities and never challenge authority. You didn't go to medical school. You, you're not the top person within your field. They are. They're the ones who sit on committees and, and give Congress their input, and there's never a challenge. To you, there's never credibility. That is how this gets injected into the body politic. Efforts are even underway to make criticism of Israel's illegal settlements on Palestinian land a criminal act. Activism supporting divestiture from firms supporting Israel's apartheid over Palestinians are equally being repressed. In fact, the government alone, along with Google and Facebook, monitor every single thing said about Israel. And if it's not officially acceptable, then Wikipedia and Google and others are playing the role of censor. And they are now an official agent of attack on the character of those who raise legitimate civil questions. You're no longer allowed to have even a civil question. They're getting laws passed. Our recent episode may offer a glimpse into the potential nightmare hidden in the marriage between skepticism, scientism, and the new atheism. <clears throat> Last Sunday, the world's most popular atheist and representative of scientism is Richard Dawkins. He stated on Twitter that eugenics is a workable solution. Now, you may say that. Who would say that? Well, it was a strange pronouncement that Dawkins sent to his almost three million followers. He did not defend eugenics for any more moral reason. However, ethical concerns aside, we should not assume it is a workable solution to problems. He posted, quote, it's one thing to deplore eugenic on ideological, political, and moral grounds. It's quite another to conclude that it wouldn't work in practice. Of course it would. It works for cows, horses, pigs, dogs, and roses. Why on earth wouldn't it work for humans? Facts ignore ideology, end quote. So says Richard Dawkins. Writing for the blog The Friendly Atheist, Herman Meta speculates that perhaps Dawkins was making an off-the-cuff comment about the resignation of UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson's senior advisor, Andrew Sabisky, who has voiced approval of a eugenics program to prevent, quote, a permanent underclass, end quote. Sabisky resigned only a day or two after Daw uh, before Dawkins' tweet. If that is the case, then Dawkins is acknowledging eugenics' feasibility to rid society of the unwanted or improving the race through selective breeding while not condoning such a program itself. Nevertheless, from my perspective, to understand how dangerous this idea is, we only have to recall the Nazis' final solution, the Gypsies' final solution. Throughout the world, the African Americans or Africans' final solution. In the United States, the African Americans' final solution. The worst of Stalin's show trials, Mao's public executions, slave trade and the forced sterilization of black women in the American South and the red baiting of McCarthyism. What freedom of choice do you ever proffer to the eugenics victim? When do they have a say-so in whether they have to be sterilized or castrated or used as human guinea pigs like the CDC did in the Tuskegee experiment? You didn't see the CDC going up to Connecticut going to one of the wealthiest suburbs in Connecticut and asking the billionaires who live there, we're doing a study of 400 more or less citizens. We're not going to treat you. We're not going to cure you of syphilis. But for the next 40 years, we'd like to see what happens. That, is, that would never happen. 
But if you did the same thing, which the, they did with poor indigenous blacks, no eyebrows were raised. Of course, Dawkins' belief that eugenic breeding of other species has been successful is ludicrous. Pedigree breeding of dogs and horses, for example, has been a medical horror for their owners and veterinarians. One angry respondent to Dawkins' argument comparing human genetics with his unquestionable views that eugenic practices work for other species rely, quote, I work on human genetics and am an honorary professor at a UCL Genetic Institute. I'm the editor-in-chief of a journal which used to be called Annals of Eugenics. I just wanted to say that we now know from the latest research that eugenics simply would not work, end quote. Greg Epstein, an ethicist and humanist chaplain at Harvard and MIT, tweeted in response, quote, so unacceptable for Richard Dawkins to tweet about eugenics without clearly condemning it. Dawkins is supposedly one of our exemplars of humanism in science outreach, yet today he's given every manner of passive and active bigot an opening to consider persecution on steroids, end quote. A more abrasive reply came from Scott Lynch. <clears throat> quote, you absolute pin-headed simpleton. It doesn't work in practice because too many of the goals turn out to be arbitrary fantasies, and too many of those fantasies are the pet projects of abusive bigots who F up any civilization they get their hands on. Are you new here? Unquote. Clearly, Dawkins has again fallen into sloppy reasoning, in my opinion, and logic, a habit he has shown repeatedly over the course of his public career in unleveled diatribes against Muslims, religious believers, and medical practices outside the pharmaceutical establishment. On one occasion, he made the argument on Twitter that being raped by a stranger was more than a, quote, date rape, end quote, to try to prove scorn uh, some nonsensical point on faulty logic. He did the same thing when it came to pedophilia. Quote, mild pedophilia is bad, violent pedophilia is worse. If you think that's an endorsement of mild pedophilia, well, go away and learn how to think, end quote. I guess that follows the same logic of decapitation by a finely crafted guillotine blade is milder and less bad than decapitation with a rusty, blunt centimar. No doubt, whatever an inarticulate reason that compelled him to write this post, as an ardent secularist who claims to espouse humanistic values, Dawkins cannot possibly be advocating for eugenic programs. And it caused quite a firestorm. Dawkins and other skeptics frequently align themselves with humanism a philosophy that stresses humanity's inherent potential towards goodness, in effect where religion has nothing to do with it. Therefore, they seek a moral high ground on their judgments, as there is no problem with a person being an atheist or agnostic. Every person has a similar right to their own beliefs without being disparaged and criticized. However, for anyone to think of themselves as a humanist we find having a code of ethics or spiritual belief to live by an essential to claim their moniker. What we are witnessing are militant atheists such as Dawkins engaging in intellectual blood sport by considering themselves the most enlightened minds and intellectually superior to everyone who dis disagrees with them. You all remember William F. Buckley. He was a perfect example of the highly erudite intellectual and totally lacking in innate wisdom in priding himself and out-debating his opponents. This is a common characteristic throughout the skeptic community that also permeates Wikipedia and Silicon Valley and many of America's leading think tanks. There appears to be a strange romantic attraction between the radicalized scientism preached by the skeptic movement with the kind of modern atheism promulgated by Dawkins and his colleagues. If the human mind, consciousness, and subjective experience is nothing more than a computerized blueprint from an organ within our skull that is composed of protein, fat, water, and electricity, and if there is nothing divine, nothing sacred, nothing eternal in our world or universe, 
that can give us a greater sense of purpose and values than the rationale for a eugenic tendency is intrinsic to this question and equation. Therefore, it is not surprising that the skeptic organizations have failed to challenge or chide Dawkins' acknowledgement of eugenics viability. Far more important is what the skeptics believe, but rather the volumes of scientific literature that point to humans being a far more than a computerized robot and that there is something far more mysterious in our lives and the purpose of this earth. Hence what skeptics condemn as quackery and pseudoscience and meritless is supported by clinical human experience and thousands of studies. In the early 20th century, many proponents advocated for eugenic practices to weed out the, quote, degenerates, quote, feeble-minded from society. They all had something in common. They were atheists and believers in dogmatic scientific materialism. The term eugenics was first coined by Darwin's distant cousin, Francis Galton, who believed the human race could evolve more efficiently through selective breeding. Early eugenic arguments were similar to the Nazis' theory of, of life unworthy of life concerted efforts. And by the way, that, that's, that's something you rarely hear. It's Lebin uh, Sun Verta. Now, noted atheists were of the period who were eugenicists believe kill off the weaker ones to make it a better world for the stronger ones. Notable atheists were Planned Parenthood's founder, Margaret Sanger, a massive racist, by the way, Bertrand Russell, who in 1924 raised the suggestion of distributing procreation tickets in order to preserve the gene pool of the intellectual elite from being polluted by inferior humans, the average person meaning. And of course, the Rockefeller Foundation contributed furthering the and funding the German eugenicist program. And by the way, did you know the Rockefeller Foundation funded Joseph Mengele? Yes before the evil doctor left for Auschwitz to carry out his horrendous experiments. But before the arrival of the Nazis, eugenics was well underway across the United States. 27 states had policies of forced sterilization and racial segregation and marriage restrictions with California as eugenics epicenter. Nearly half of the 60,000 forced sterilizations recorded were performed under California laws to the delight of the U.S. Army doctor and venereal disease specialist Paul Popino an atheist, and he, according to his youngest son, Popino, authored the 1918 book, Applied Eugenics, which included a chapter on ways to exterminate undesirables, including execution, exposure to harsh environments, such as freezing water and pathogenic organisms. This is not to suggest that we are singling out atheism for discrimination. That's not true. Buddhists and Jains and classical Taoists do not believe in a transcendent being, or a personalized God, they too can be categorized as atheists, or more properly, as a atheist faiths. However, these Asian religions recognize the sanctity of life based upon other factors like karma, non-localized consciousness, and non-duality that scientific atheism ridicules and denounces. In the case of Buddhism, it has conducted the world's longest empirical-based experiment into the study of subjective experience and consciousness with innumerable advanced meditators over the course of its 2,500-year history. The biological sciences, including neuroscience and evolutionary biology, have never, not once, been able to properly define and explain the human mind or human consciousness. For that reason, the question of why and how we are conscious of, of, of the phenomena of life experience has never been fully explained and can't be. Consciousness and the causative factors behind human behavior still remain a profound mystery that eludes all neuroscientists despite their hypotheses and theories. Serious Buddhist practitioners, on the other hand, have been probing the depths of the conditioned mind and the nature of consciousness and have repeatedly achieved discoveries that modern neuroscientists with their MRI scans can barely comprehend. In conclusion, <clears throat> Richard Dawkins and others have a right to their opinion. That we do not challenge. Wikipedia editors have a right to their opinion. Jimmy Wells, uh, there's a photograph of him and Dawkins together. Many of the people who edit all of the complimentary and holistic blogs 
or the bios and information on Wikipedia, really look up at Dawkins. As we've written on many previous occasions, Wikipedia has become the world's loudest soundboard for atheist scientism. The skeptics who advocate this dogmatic faith wield enormous power over significant content that's read by hundreds of millions of people per week. And that denies and censors the freedom of speech of scientists, clinicians, provocative non-skeptic thinkers, and educated patients who make efforts to set the record straight about alternative medicine, parapsychology, and, and mysticism. But they're given no forums. They're excluded. They're censored everywhere. Currently, there are tens of thousands of doctors and clinicians with millions of patients who have made free choice to treat or be treated by means other than pharmaceutical drugs and invasive surgeries. But all their voices, all the volumes of science and period literature are censored. It is one thing to disagree with another, another's point of view. That is perfectly fine. Hence, dialogue, debate, and open discussion are essential. If you disagree with an opinion, but that does not mean conversation is dead or that one must resort to defamation, ridicule, and outright hatred. But that is exactly what you see from Wikipedia. Therefore, modern skepticism and the people editing everything on alternative and complementary medicine on Wikipedia, these are devout advocates of authoritarianism based upon scientific materialism. And that contains the very seeds for rebirth of, in our opinion, the eugenic philosophy. For this reason, people should be encouraged to explore this ideology more deeply, discover its contradictions, irrational weaknesses, and its threats to a free and open society. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Gary Nall, and have a nice day.